this and I will check with Dr. Shabazz. Okay, I'm back on, but I still can't get video, but I can hear and see everybody else. Okay, Ms. Bridges. Well, we'll, you know, I'm glad you can see and hear us. And I don't know what is wrong with this, but oh, well, it's all right. Yeah. Um, let me just do a couple check-ins here. Okay. So I have checked in with Dr. Shabazz. Um, again, Yvonne was going to try to make it, but I think we should uh, go ahead and get started so that we can um, maximize our time together. So Jennifer, I see you started recording, right? Yes. Okay. okay. So there are four of us, so we can officially start. Let me just go ahead and pull up. I have, um, okay. All right. So I am calling to order the September 18th meeting of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly at 2.04 p.m., with the extension of Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Um, so I'm going to do a quick sound check to make sure everyone can hear and be heard. And then, oh, and here we have Dr. Shabazz. Excellent. Welcome, Dr. Shabazz. Do I see some others with us too? That's excellent. <laughs> okay. Um, so I will start uh, with you, Dr. Shabazz. Can you hear us? And Absolutely. We have a good connection. Thank you. Okay, excellent. And Ms. Bridges? Yes, I can hear you and see you. Sorry okay. you can't see me. <laughs> All right, no worries. Um, and Dr. Rhodes? I can hear and see everyone. Excellent. Hala? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. And um, Jennifer, mm -hmm. when I do the sound check for you, then I'll just, it will be natural for you then to um, welcome Asa to to our meeting and, and just to introduce them uh, to us. Sure. Or have them Thank introduce you. themselves. <laughs> Go ahead. So yes, I can hear and see everyone. And now I would like to turn it over to Asa so that they can introduce themselves. Go ahead, Asa. Um, hi, I'm Asa Stanley Kemmler. I'm the AmeriCorps member who's uh, working with both the DEI department and CRESS. Um, happy to be here, even if it's just to observe. Wonderful. We're we're very happy you're here. And if you have any questions at any point, please do uh, just use the raise hand function or just chime in and and we'll. Um, I'm, I'm happy that you're here. Um, Thank you. You, on the other hand, back there needs to quiet down. Um, sorry, my dog is hearing something outside. Okay, so um, let me just mute for one second to quiet uh, every every all of the dogs down and be right back. Oh, Deborah, I thought your photo was your your you were gonna show up because it looks like your video is changing. Like it says your name and then doesn't say your name. Does anybody else see that? Yeah, yes, I see that too. I thought so, but now I can't see anybody. <laughs> <laughs> the line the line is out of the stop video, the red line, and it sounds like but I now I can't see anyone. Before I couldn't get my my video, but I could see everybody else. Now I now it's both gone. 
Feel free to come in with both and have two boxes if you can see if we can see you on one. I can't one. see anything. Okay, you can still hear us though, right? I can hear you. That's it. I can't just can't see you anymore. Oh goodness. Um, there is a quorum if you want to try to go. Yeah. Back out and come back in because there is a quorum. I'll try. Miss Bridges. <laughs> uh huh. Before you go, I just I I want to start the meeting um, with an acknowledgement. Okay. Um, and so I I want to um, last week uh, we had a moment of um, silence in, in our committee um, to send prayers and uh, and wishes to somebody in our community. And today, I want to acknowledge the loss of Dr. Shabazz's beloved wife, Dr. Demetria Shabazz, um, a uh, beautiful and courageous uh, human being and community member and uh, just a great loss. And I couldn't possibly pay tribute um, to all of the ways in which D impacted this community um, in, in this time. And I know we will uh, begin the process of paying tribute to Dr. Shabazz um, as, as uh, you know, is, is already happening. So I wanted to open up just a little space right now, if anybody would like to um, comment or um, have anything that they would like to, to add to that. So uh, Dr. Shabazz, I'm deeply sorry for the passing of Dean. I was shocked, still am shocked, uh, and and may her memory be a blessing to us all. Thank you, Dr. Rhodes. Uh, Hala. Thank you. I have um, personally been in communication with Dr. Shubhas, but I would also like to bring something to this group. I would like for us to dedicate this final report to Dr. Shabazz's supreme love and wife, Dr. Demetria Shabazz. From the moment Dee came to Amherst, she was a force and a presence that has been unparalleled. She lived her life dedicated to reducing the harm of anti-Black racism, to demanding social justice and equity, to walking the walk, and to being in mentorship in ways that have powerfully impacted so many of us. She worked with others to bring Kwanzaa, Juneteenth, and other Black liber liberatory celebrations to our town. She gifted us a legacy of speaking truth to power, of lifting up the most marginalized and silenced in this town, of being a person who stood in her own power, and of helping others of us fight off the imposter syndrome and the internalized inferiority and other byproducts of white supremacy ideology that I personally, as a Black person in this town continue to fight so that I may mentor and lead our youth prayerfully in a way that D has. Respectfully, I can't think of a better person to dedicate this final report to. Thank you. Thank you, Hala. On behalf of Jim. Dr. Shabazz, would you like Jennifer to first go? Yeah, okay. So um, thank you, Heather. That was absolutely beautiful. And thank you, Michelle, for giving us this time to reflect. As in, um, so I just wanted to say that, um, so clearly Dean and I didn't always see eye to eye, but I have to say that I've always respected her and admired her dedication, commitment, and um to equity work and I'm thinking like I don't know what will end up with the space for the youth empowerment center or what the next new road will be but I think that it would be worth um either the pre preceding group to or successor group sorry to um think about considering naming one of the streets or buildings after Mrs. Dr. Shabazz and my heart goes out to you and your family um, and please let us know if you need anything. 
Thank you all on behalf of the uh, entire family, our um, the children uh, that D and I brought into this world, now adults, are here uh, with me um, for this meeting as well. We are all um, very moved by your uh, your words, your expressions, and um, and and this uh, uh, and dedication of our work over these last two years. Um, in, in Demetria's name. Um, she definitely was an abiding uh, force uh, for me over this period on this committee. Uh, I think perhaps others, uh, and, of, and of course others all throughout the town in the ways that um, Jennifer Moyston has just uh, eloquently uh, stated. Uh, thank you, Hala. Thank you, uh, um, Irv, um, and uh, all of you here for this uh very, very much. I just will mention, I'm just uh, confirmed with um, uh, the folks at the Most Holy Redeemer Church in Hadley, Mass, that we are looking at a um, funeral service on uh, Saturday, uh, September uh, 30th. And um, the, uh, uh, but there, but we are looking at a more public uh, celebration of her life uh, in October. Uh, uh, we're thinking around the time of her birthday, which is October 26th. So um, those are our two dates that we are, uh, we're looking at. All right. So again, thank you all so much for this. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. And I see Ms. Bridges is back. Ms. Bridges, did you want to add anything right now? Um. I just wanted to send all my love. Um, uh, Nick and I were with them and uh, they know we love them. And if we need, if they need anything at all, Dr. Shabazz, you know where we are, right? Hopefully you can see him nodding. <laughs> I can't. I can't. This doesn't work. Oh, anymore. sorry. Oh. <laughs> That's all right, darling. I can't. Absolutely. I just, Absolutely. I've tried so hard in and out. Reboot. It just doesn't do it. But you know, prayers to you all. Thank you, Miss Bridges. Okay. And so um, we shall dedicate. Uh, this report in memory of and in honor of Dr. Dimitri Shabazz um, and um, let uh, all of the ways that she has touched and will continue to touch our lives um, go on. And Dr. Rhodes, I saw your, you were, your mouth was moving, but maybe you were talking to somebody in the room. I think you're, there you go. You good? Yeah, I didn't raise my hand. Okay, all right, all right. perfect. Okay, so um, I am going to do two more things before we move into the meat of our meeting. One is to approve minutes, um, and then the other is to call our first period of public comment. Um, so, uh, to approve minutes, uh, Jennifer, just checking with you that the minutes that are on the agenda are, are good. Yes. Um, you should have received a packet of them. Okay. And everything is fine. Everything is no changes. Okay. So I'm just going to make the motion then and, and look but for did a Did you guys receive the packet? Am I correct? Okay. I thought sometimes I dream that I do things. So I just wanted to make sure that I actually did do it. You sent a packet. Let me just make sure um, you did send a packet. Um, I'm not sure. Let's see here. Let's assume that you did because I remember receiving it. And then if anything, we'll, you know, we'll clean it up. But I think I'm my memory is that you you did. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm gonna make a motion to approve uh, the minutes um, from July 31st, August 7th, August 14th, August 21st, August 28th, and September 11th, 2023. Is there a second? Second. 
Okay, that was Dr. Rhodes, I believe. Uh, let's take a roll call vote. I will start with you, Dr. Shabazz. Shabazz, yes. Thank you. Uh, and Hala? Lord, yes. Great. Uh, Ms. Bridges? Yes. Excellent. And Dr. Rhodes? Rhodes, aye. Thank you. And I'm an aye, so those pass unanimously. Uh, now I'm going to call a period of public comment. This will be the first of two periods of public comment. And I will read the public comment statement now. During the public comment period, the chair will recognize members of the public when called on. Please identify yourself by stating your name, pronouns, and residential address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the discretion of the chair based upon the number of people who wish to speak. The AHRA will not engage in a dialogue or comment uh, on a matter raised, although we will be listening very closely and sometimes we are able to answer questions. So if you'd like to make a public comment, I don't see anyone coming in by phone. Um, so just uh, please use the raise hand function and we will bring you into the room. And again, there will be a second period of comment later in the meeting. Okay. So I'm not seeing any commenters right now. Um, so we will move on. I thought I'll just give an overview of what we have to cover today. Um, so today is the day that we are going to, I hope, approve our final report. Um, everyone should have seen um, the latest final report. Uh, all of the items that were new um, have were were highlighted in the report to make it easier for you to to reference. Um, so today, the idea is to talk about the final report to see if there are any uh, questions or comments, in, additional uh, inclusions or subtractions. Um, and part of that discussion is for us to review a couple of items that have not been approved yet, one being the successor body committee charge, uh, the second being we have to fill in the blanks on the fund recommendation, um, and then uh, there is one item that I would, well, actually two items that I would like to bring to our attention based on some feedback. One of them being the recommendation that we've made to the school superintendent. And then another uh, is related to the historically, the historical black churches in our community. Um, and Hal and I had a discussion about that. So when we get to that, we, we can, um, Hal and I will discuss that. Um, so uh, as far as acknowledgements, I did receive uh, recommendations to include in the acknowledgements page of our report. So I, I have included those. And then I also sent our final draft press release. Um, and so we have an opportunity here to talk about that and to make sure that we're all okay with that. That will also include talking about timing um, to pub to officially publish the report. So I am going to just pause there and see if there are any just general questions about uh, the process for today's meeting. Okay, great. So I think what I'll do is I'm going to bring up the committee charge and we'll start there. Um, I did my best based on previous conversations to fill in the blanks here using a template. Um, so Jennifer, do I have the ability to share? I think I'm disabled right now from sharing screen. Let's see. You should be okay, I'm good now. Yes, thank you. All right. So... First things first, this uh, this successor body needs a name. <laughs> um, so 
I uh, right now have just used our name, um, but the floor is open um, for names. I'll just quickly go through this first section and then open the floor and then we'll move down into the other sections. So this is a standing committee. Um, the legal reference is the Amherst Home Rule, Ch Home Rule Charter Section 2.5. The appointing authority is the town manager. Um, the questions we have to answer are whether uh, we would like this to be a, a seven voting member body, a nine voting member body, or some other number, um, whether we would like to have additional non-voting members, perhaps, for example, an advisor or um, even somebody from one of the local uh, institutions, um, you know, could be an example and then uh, whether we would like to have liaisons. Um, I just put in here that perhaps we would have one town council liaison and, and maybe one liaison from the CSSJC. Um, these are just suggestions. Term of appointment is two. Uh, again, that's a suggestion. And um, support staff is, I think, Jennifer, the appropriate support staff would be the DEI department. Does that sound right? Okay. So the floor is open um, to comment on any of these highlighted items here. And again, um, this is something that we do need to finalize today because it is, it, it is currently included as part of the appendix in our final report. Asa, do okay. I see a hand? Um, hi, just because I'm not up to speed on everything the committee has been doing, uh, what will the authority or purpose of this uh, sort of successor committee be? That's an excellent question. So generally speaking, this committee will be charged with carrying forward the work of the AHRA, so ensuring that the recommendations um, that were made in our final report are implemented um, being sort of the overseer of the fund. Um, and we're going to actually get to that down here when we get to the purpose and uh, the charge. So you'll get a, a little bit of a better idea about that. Does that answer the question? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dr. Shabazz, I see your hand. Trying to lower the hand now, just to, but I, I think maybe because we're in share mode, I I don't know, but can you hear me? Yes. Do you want me to take share mode off? Is that more helpful for you? Yeah. Let me do that. Well, Go ahead. It seemed like my screen was was frozen. It still seems like it's okay. Anyway, um, so if, as many of you know, a a model in my mind for the structure, the ongoing structure of the town's efforts uh, to create reparative justice, um, you know, which we've discussed before and in my mind is um, not a time stamped, it's an ongoing project. Um, the model has been the Community Preservation Act and the Community Preservation Act Committee uh, which is a standing committee here in the town. Modifying the overview of that uh, committee, um, we could very well track our own mission statement of this, of this successor body. That is to say, studies the needs, possibilities, and resources of the town regarding African-American reparations, makes recommendation to the town council annually for the acquisition, creation, and uh, funding of uh, initiatives uh, supported by the African-American community. Um, and 
that can be further wordsmithed, but that pretty much comes right out of the charge, right out of the overview of the Community Preservation Act Committee. Relative to the name then, um, it could be a uh, rep uh, reparative justice committee. It could be, um, you could put African-American in there as well. Uh, so African-Americans uh, Reparations uh, Act Committee, but uh, I don't have a final language on that. Um, but uh, the other thing then is that in the case of CPA, it is a nine member body and it is um, has <laughs> people from other related commissions, um, namely the Conservation Commission and the Historical Commission, Planning Board, um, LSSE Commission, and um, a member of the Housing Authority and, and four citizens at large. I would not recommend duplicating that, that same framework, but along the lines of what you, Michelle, suggested, uh, perhaps connecting with the Human Rights Commission and connecting with the Community Safety and Social Justice Commission might be appropriate um, uh, related commissions to connect with. Um, I think that um, the there is a valid question of CPA itself since uh, some of the funding measures we would invariably, uh, this body would invariably take up would concern areas covered by the CPA, that is namely uh, matters of historical preservation, uh, open space, recreation, and um, the um, uh, uh, community housing. So uh, it might even be useful um, to perhaps consider a CPA uh, member being uh, a part of the the evolved the ongoing uh, reparations uh, committee. Um, I don't necessarily see planning board. I don't necessarily see finance committee. These are all groups, of course, that the work would would interact with. But I don't necessarily see them as having a role to play in giving in giving uh, guidance to how. Um, the the uh, the initiatives are are selected and how the initiatives are packaged and and brought together to then be presented to the council for for vote. But um, but anyway, those are uh, some of the some of my thoughts relative to fleshing out the uh, the reparations committee. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Shabazz. That was really really helpful. Um, yes, Ms. Bridges. I didn't do that. It's doing it on its own. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. No clue. I <laughs> took it to IT. They said it was fixed, but it's not. Yeah. All right. No worries. Okay. Okay, so um, I guess I what I'll add, and I'm just going to go ahead and, and share screen again here. Um, what I'll add to what Dr. Shabazz was uh, suggesting is, in addition to um, the ways in which the CPA, I loved all of that language. And Jennifer, just a note here, um, we are not able today to do an audio transcription. So um, in order to get the transcription for the report, I will need to get the Zoom link from you as soon as possible after our meeting today. So I just wanted to make sure I note that. Um, so additionally, I included some language here um, about uh, working with other committees. So working with other town committees and departments to pursue reparative projects 
and initiatives, um, and also working with the CSSJC and the HRC to advance shared goals. Um, I also had here, uh, similar to what Dr. Shabazz basically covered, the acceptance of proposals from the community, um, the uh, consultation with the Black community, which is one of our recommendations. And so that just sort of reflects the recommendation. Um, and then um, overseeing the dedicated reparations fund and also identifying additional sources of funding for reparative justice work. Um, so I think that if we take what Dr. Shabazz just suggested and sort of tighten that language up and 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 uh, couple it with some of my language here, we'll have a pretty solid charge. Um, in terms of the purpose, I've simply just said that the mission is to carry forward the work of the HRA in accordance with the recommendations in their final report. Um, and I think I do want to ensure before uh, we finalize this, the composition. So I've heard nine members um, and I haven't heard uh, anybody say differently. If there is an argument to be made that it should be seven, uh, let's let's have that let's have that discussion. I, nine, the sort of concern with nine is, um, the process in terms of filling those positions um, every couple of years and um, scheduling can also be more challenging when you're talking nine people. However, um, I would say that not everybody needs to come to every meeting either. So, um, you know, it might not be a bad thing to have nine and, and even if there are vacancies from time to time. Um, yes, Dr. Spaz. I, I was going to I was going to say that I could see the lower number uh, provided that um, if we weren't doing any of those um, uh, related bodies, you know, uh, particularly uh, Human Rights Commission and um, uh, Community Safety and Social Justice Committee and uh, perhaps CPA, if we're not dedicating uh, that, you know, that we would request uh, that those bodies would name, uh, delegate a, a, a member to the, uh, to the reparations committee, then I could definitely see going to the smaller number as you, you've raised here. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Dr. Rhodes. Yeah, the smaller the number, the better, because it's really difficult getting people uh, to set on committees. Uh, and this, having a, a smaller number, such as five or seven, would be ideal. Uh, and because otherwise you have people out there beating the bushes of try to fill these slots. And I don't think we should put the future, this future group in that position. So I would argue for a smaller number such as five. Hey, thank you, Dr. Rhodes. Hala? Um, this is partially relevant, maybe partially not. I, I hear the points about the smaller number. And I also would love for us as a town, I'm gonna to take responsibility for this. To, there's a lot of people I didn't know about serving on committees or that there was even a possibility. So I don't know, I would love for our town to like get out there to, you know, the apartments where I live and just let, hey, there's different ways we can be engaged. And so I'm going to take on some of that work because there's so many people I think would be willing to serve. We just have no idea there's that opportunity. So it's sort of relevant, sort of not, but I get, I hear the thing around seven or smaller. So just my two cents. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so it sounds like some compromise between nine and five would be seven. I think seven is a good number to put in there. And then, of course, um, it may not always be at seven, um, but we can have the goal of having seven. And if we have um, some liaisons like from the CSSJC um, or, and or the HRC, um, I don't know sort of what the future of town council liaisons is going to look like. I know there's been discussions happening around that, so that might need to play itself out. 
Um, but I would like us to look here at um, some of the composition notes that I've put in here so far. Uh, this first one comes straight from the CSSJC uh, charge and says that no fewer than five of the seven voting members shall represent Black, Indigenous, people of color, or other historically marginalized communities. In terms of this particular uh African American reparations committee, do we want it to be five of seven represent black period? Do we want some other number? Um, so I see Dr. Rhodes has his hand raised. You know, the thing is you can say five to seven, you know, a minimum of five and a maximum of seven members. We don't have to say, well, five or seven could be five to seven members. Up um, here, you mean, right, Dr. Rose? Yeah. Like, okay. When we're talking about the number. It could be five to seven. Why Why say five or seven? Why not say five to seven? And that gives the future people in the future some flexibility. <clears throat> I support that. Yeah, I'm good with that. That's great. Um, do you have any thoughts, Dr. Rhodes, on this uh, composition piece? So I also included one youth representative. I've seen committees doing that more recently, um, including the CSSJC and the HRC. I think that's an excellent, um, an excellent inclusion. Um, so I, I'd love to know what folks think about that. So Dr. Rhodes, I see your yeah. hand, and then Dr. Yeah, it's, it's it, it, you know if you if you if we uh, start saying where uh, these members are to going to come from. Uh, if if we're only talking five to seven, we you only have so many that you can say, hey, it has to come from group A, B, or C, and D before you're up to your five, and uh, that isn't good. Uh, but anyway, I I, I would think that um, the representation. Uh, that we really should say, hey, there ha there has to be X number who are BIPOC. And then the rest can be filled out. But we, we should make that uh, that particular kind of statement. And I think if we want to do the five to seven, um, so there's flexibility, then we'll want to include this as a percentage as opposed to a number. So, um, you know, is there some percentage... Um, so I'm going to go to Jennifer. I'm going to, unless you have a, a minutes question, I'm going to go to Dr. Shabazz and then I'm going to come to you. Dr. Shabazz. Um, okay. So, um, I, so first of all, I guess I'm hearing folks are leaning more toward the, uh, not designating within the composition, any seats from other related committees but rather that we would seek to have as non-voting liaisons the CSSJC, the Human Rights Commission, perhaps uh, even CPA, if if I'm, and, and really even thinking about in, uh, at least encouraging uh, liaison work, it might also be important to help to encourage liaison with public health um, uh, the public uh, health uh, area as well. But um, in short, I'm hearing more so than those being a uh, um, a category we're representing that one out of the seven be someone from CSSJC or someone. And knowing that that also means that you're putting additional work on that representative that's a part of that committee, what I'm hearing is is more leave it more flexible as a liaison, which means people may come when we when that committee would really push for someone to come, but generally they probably won't come. Uh, you know, we started out with with a couple of town council liaisons, but uh, as our weekly almost weekly meetings have progressed, we we know that that has fallen off. So uh, that is just the nature of when it's a liaison kind of relationship versus they are a structured voting member of, of the committee. So I'm, I'm getting my head around that, first of all. And then secondly, I would say, um, similar to the way we said 
um, five to seven black, uh, I would like to say one um, one or more or one to three uh, youth. Um, and when I think of youth and how I, um, one, we've identified that that is one of the priority areas we're recommending is the situation of African-American young people in our town, uh, particularly in the 16 to 25 um, uh, age range, particularly our high schoolers and our college students. Um, in the audience is um, a uh, uh, our current facilitator of the Black Assembly of Amherst, Massachusetts, Milan Clark. And Milan has written a very, very powerful um, piece uh, that um, I uh, hope could even be a part of the records of, of some of the uh, things that we we are look, have been informed by. But in it, um, he particularly notes how, uh, in many ways, while we are a college town, uh, students, particularly Black students, are in many ways a very exploited, marginalized part of this college town. And, and that, uh, you know, the, the it, it's important that reparative justice take in mind these, uh, these students who come here looking to further their education, but again, come to a place that still has a lot of barriers and has a lot of uh, problems, along with a lot of good things, but a lot of problems as well. And so um, if we're about trying to alleviate and lessen those problem areas, then um, I would think that trying to really offer um, a seat at the table to a student from Hampshire College, Amherst College, UMass, uh, as well as from uh, just the general community or, or high school um, community would really be a strong signal. Um, and again, as you say, in future, this could even change down the line, but, but it could be a real strong signal of how this, uh, how, how we see reparative justice needing a strong focus on the on, on our young people, our young African Americans. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. And we can actually put a note in the composition that this is a guide for the town manager. So um, not to sort of hold up the committee if we're unable to identify these folks, but to give the town manager a guide to what uh, what our vision would be based on what you just described. Okay, so Jennifer and then Dr. Rhodes. So a couple of things. One is that, you know, the Human Rights Commission have members who attend different meetings purposefully just to be able to come back to report to the group as opposed to having this, like a actual committee member that sits on both. So for instance, we have someone from the HRC that goes to or listens to the recording of the um, Amherst Affordable Housing Trust. So that way we get that information. So that's one way to look at it. And um, the other one is I'm going to have to hop off because I have three o'clock interviews. So I'm just going to double check, Michelle, to make sure you're the host. And then um, I hope that you guys enjoy the rest of your meeting. And I, and I do have a question about when we dismantle, it sounds so scary to say. So um, what, I mean, does that just happen automatically after you report to the council or, or what? Like, because I don't know if you guys want a follow up meeting or not. Yeah, I'm going to get clarification from Lynn and or the clerk on that. Um, I I know that we'll want to meet one more time to before we present. But you're raising a really good question about does our charge sort of end after I would like for us to get together in some sort of social capacity after we present, which doesn't have to be a public meeting necessarily, because if we're no longer a public body, then we are not in violation of open meeting law to meet and socialize. Um, so I'll get some clarification on that and I'll I'll let you know. Perfect. Thank you. And then I'll get the meeting sent over to you as soon as I have it. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. And hey, Jennifer, thank you for everything, everything that you do every day. 
um, in this committee and in every other committee that you're part of and in, in just every way. Um, so I just, I want, we'll have, I hope a chance to acknowledge um, each other better at another time, but I just want you to hear that. Oh, thank you. It has been a pleasure um, going down this journey with you guys all. This is like very important stuff. Thank you and have a good rest of your meeting. And all for right. some reason, if everybody gets kicked off, just hop back in. Okay. Thank you. All right, Dr. Rhodes. So in terms of the composition of this assessor group, I want us to keep in mind that it's going, this successor group is going to be operating in the same kind of environment they were operating in, in terms of a political, social, social political uh, environment. And therefore, the, some of the people on that committee must have some kind of social or political standing within this community. Uh, in other words, I don't want it to just to be a group that really would be almost a straw in the wind. And it has to have some substance uh, if it's going to carry on the work of this uh, of this committee. So you might recall, Dr. Rhodes, that in the AHRA's um, composition, we included that I think it was two people would have had experience um, serving uh, either in an appoint appointed or elected capacity. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yes. No, I, in other words, if you, this successor group has to have some substance. It, it, it has to have some substance that's, that is recognizable by the community. And by the community, I mean uh, the political community, i.e. the council, uh, and others. Uh, if we just put on people uh, without substance, then we're then I don't, I don't understand how the group, how our mission can go on. Okay. Um, well, I think uh, you know, just my gut reaction to that is that I, I believe that any community member that would go through the process of applying and uh, sort of going through the um, interview with, uh, you know, the group that the town manager has um, providing those interviews, I think would add substance um, to the composition. However, I do understand that it is also important in terms of the uh, political landscape, particularly if we want to ensure that these recommendations are being implemented by the council with approval of the council. Um, I also understand your point. So no, I think it's, it's it's more related to, uh, you know, I, I guess I believe there should be a student on there or some youth, but. Uh, I, I, I would not certainly want the majority of them or even semi majority of them uh, of the members being students. Um, it just wouldn't it just wouldn't work. Politically. Okay. So maybe we want to cut this back to um, one youth representative and one student from a higher ed institution. These are, again, just guidelines um, for the town manager. Um, and Asa, I see your hand is raised. Um, I would just wanted to point out that um, there are a lot of um, Black and BIPOC communities on campuses that do have students who have pretty significant um, S, um, social capital in terms of like um, the communities on campus. So it wouldn't necessarily take away from their sort of community substance to say a leader of a leader of a group on campus to be part of the committee. Um, so having them perhaps also be in a li uh, liaison role rather than as a full member might also be appropriate. Excellent. That is, yeah, that's very, very important. And um, I think it's, it, it's important to remember that, you know, so thank you for bringing that um, forward. And so I think some there it, it sounds to me like between liaisons um 
and voting members. Um, we're only going to have one youth, only going to have one student from higher ed instead of saying one or more. Um, and then um, I, I really like ACE's uh, thought process around I potentially identifying or that perhaps those folks that are already in leadership positions um, and that already have that substantive experience uh, would come forward. And just tying in what Hala was talking about earlier, I think um, there are efforts and there need to be more efforts to reach more people in the community and that's one of those that's one of those places um the one outstanding item here then is the number i have up here the number of non-voting members um so this is different than a liaison um or obviously a voting member um this might be so last week i uh shared with you that I had received some input around having somebody on the committee or advising the committee that has um, nonprofit and or uh, fund management experience. And we had a little bit of a discussion about that. So somebody that has experience implementing programs, has experience allocating funds um, uh, from the kind of fund that we have here. Um, is that something that with thought after last week's meeting, folks have uh, any opinion on? Okay. Not too much more than, than before that, you know, I think some of the expertise relative to the municipal fund process we would uh, always i think the this this group would always be able to access through the through uh uh you know through the town's finance director but that's about where i sit with it okay all right well let's leave it at that and i'm going to stop the share so what i'll do is we'll get this cleaned up and i'll make sure everybody has a chance to review it just to, to you know again it, please do not respond all um and please only respond to me jennifer and pamela or only to me are there any other questions or comments on the charge before we move on? I still don't have a name, <laughs> so I am concerned about that. Um, Dr. Shabazz, you said I wrote down a couple of possibilities. Um, African-American Reparations Act Committee. Um, I'm not sure if we can refer to it as an act committee because the act in the CPA refers to a state law or a state, you know, the act, the CPA act, um, maybe one day we'll be able to refer to it as that. I agree. Um, but it could simply be the African-American reparations committee. Um, it could sticking with African heritage. I don't know if we've, if, if we've changed that, uh, since we got started, um, it could also be, um, you know, it, it, this is a big question to ask at this stage, but if this body feels like there is uh, an expansion in the community where reparations are concerned, uh, you know, is it better to keep the uh, title more broad to be able to have some of those discussions um, or could those discussions still be had in the context of keeping it um, African American. So if anyone has thoughts on that, please do share them only with me, please. Um, and if this doesn't get, you know, finalized now, that's, that's okay. Um, so I'm going to stop the share and I am going to, uh, just give me a moment to pull up the report. Uh, just did everybody have a chance while I'm doing this um, to review the final draft press release? It was sent to your email. 
And if um, if anyone um, ha would like to discuss that press release, um, please let me know. Otherwise, I'm not going to take uh, time here to, to discuss it. So let's see here. All right, I'm getting there. Okay, so um, this is our recommendation on uh, operationalizing the $2 million reparations endowment fund. You will recall that uh, we had meetings with uh, the town manager, with the council president, and with the chair of the finance committee, as well as with Sean, who was our former um, finance director. And there are three options that we've included here. Uh, all to be presented with the idea that the council will refer this to the finance committee for discussion and um, for uh, decision making. But we have some pieces that we need to fill in here. So most importantly, we need to uh, let's just review quickly. So option one, the town fully funds the reparation stabilization fund at $2 million immediately. This is by borrowing through reserves um, and then paying itself back. Um, the next is the $2 million commitment is reached over four years. So that number can be changed in option two. If we four was the number we chose based on sort of the conversations we had and, and what the reasonableness, what it, it felt to be reasonable if we chose this option. And then three, um, which was the option that the town manager asked us to consider including, um, which is that the town devotes a certain amount annually from the cannabis tax revenue to fund initiatives immediately. And then whatever would be remaining from that would go into the fund. So it would build much more slowly, um, but it would give us immediate access to some number uh, to begin um, pursuing initiatives. So uh, these are the three options that would be studied by the finance committee. And what we have to determine is here in option three, what would be that number? What is the number that we feel um, would allow us on an annual basis to make uh, meaningful um, initiatives or to bring forward meaningful initiatives, imperative initiatives. And so the floor is open for that. Dr. I see you're unmuted, but I don't hear you. Okay. Perhaps Dr. Rhodes stepped away. Dr. Shabazz, were you would so I, I just was trying to situate the uh the highlight remarks versus some of the quest the questions you're really you're really posing to us here. So uh is it to try to um is it addressing the highlights or is it addressing more whether we're we're wanting to keep all three options in or 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 go in a different direction? Could you just sort of sure? Uh, yeah, I was assuming that we were all in agreement about including the three options um, and having those referred to the finance committee. Um, it seemed in our meetings that that would be the preferred option for the folks that we met with. Um, that there would be, uh, in, as opposed to just having one option that we're asking for to give these three, I think, fairly create very creative, actually, um, possibilities. So if there is a discussion about whether to include the three options, we need to have that because I was assuming that we were including those three options. 
Um, and if not, then the idea is to understand, particularly in option three, what that number would look like um, for us to have meaningful, uh, to, to move forward with meaningful initiatives immediately. Um, so is that like, if we're thinking about cannabis tax revenue, we were in the $200,000 range and now maybe we're seeing in the $150,000 range that could go up or down. Um, but if we say out of that, that we would like immediately to have 70,000 of that be used on an annual basis, I just came up with that number toward initiatives, then the balance of whatever, uh, whatever that number is, whatever the balance is would go in to the fund to be, be build up the endowment. Um, so I just need to know from this group what that number should be here. Um, and I think this, yeah, it's, it's the same number, both of those highlighted areas. For me, for me if, if we were are creating a, a precedent for what we hope will be the ongoing level of the fund, I would say 100,000 annually is sort of our, what we ought to aspire as kind of a baseline for this. Um, that's, that's as far as I'll say. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Dr. Rhodes, what are your thoughts on that? Well, when I look at this, I say, all right, if we have a, a certain amount of money uh, coming from a particular certain source, like the cannabis fund, for example, and we to say, for example, uh, it's going to be $150,000 a year coming from that. And we would, and and, and now that $150,000 would be coming to our, to our fund, which then builds up over time. If we are saying uh, set aside the whole compounding effect in terms of building up the fund to the 10 million as soon as possible or the 2 million as soon as possible, then I would say, hey, if, if the example is $150,000 in ca cannabis fund coming towards the committee, then I would say um, make a percentage of that. 50% of that would go immediately for uh, programs for that current fiscal year, and the other 50% goes into the buildup of the fund. That's my take on it. Okay, so if we're using 150 as an example, then we have a slightly different number between uh, Dr. Shabazz and Dr. Rhodes right now. So 75,000 versus 100,000. So um, this might be, if the idea here would be for us to have consensus on this. Um, however, we could also, we haven't voted on anything, by the way, really. Well, well, yeah, well, well, by the way, it, you know, Dr. Shabazz is suggesting that if it's 150, you take 100,000 and uh, for immediate uses for fiscal for for that particular fiscal year, and the, the remainder then go to uh, building up of the fund. Well, I mean, we're only talking about money here, so uh, 100,000 uh, dollars versus uh, you know 75,000 dollars. Uh, is not something to uh, to uh, take a lot of our time in terms of discussion. Uh, so, okay. I would defer for the hundred thousand, uh, the hundred thousand, and taking the the remainder and 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 putting into the fund. And the other thing we might want to consider is instead of saying a hard number, have a percentage. Yeah, I I do like that that idea of having a percentage and and maybe it's not you know the 50-50. Uh however, just thinking of a circumstance if the cannabis tax revenue were somehow to fall below a number that we felt was meaningful, you know, then what? Then you know, so if it's 60,000 in a year. And this is the option that the the finance committee has determined is the best way forward. Um, then, 
you know, I, that puts us at risk there. So I'm not sure if we want to include some language that says if it were to fall below some number, um, that it would need to be reconsidered in the, in the context of, of, of that. And does anyone have thoughts on that? Say that again, uh, Michelle, thoughts on so my concern is, and, and perhaps the finance committee would work this out, but if option three was the preferred option and then the cannabis tax revenue falls below a number that we deem to be, you know, meaningful. So if it comes in at 60,000, you know, one year for some reason, um, does that mean that we get 40,000 less than what we had thought you know, or does that trigger um, a new discussion? Uh, you know, because um, these other options, this is what Irv's point is. I mean, why Irv um, has wanted option one to be the preferred option because he doesn't want us to run into that. None of us want to run into that circumstance. But if we're including it as an option, we have to consider the risk that that could happen. And if it does, I would like to include some language that would sort of protect us in a way as much as we could be protected in that circumstance. I, um, you know, I, I guess in my, when I think about it, I'd wrap it. It's, we're putting it into, into, the, into the hands of others in terms of making this particular decision. Uh, and the more options you give the other group, the uh, more likely they're gonna to go to the least restrict restrictive one. So I I personally, you know, I, I just like option one because it gives certainty immediately. Now I understand that, you know, the other, uh, the council and the finance committee may have a problem with that. Uh, but as, if I look at it as a negotiation point, I would put out there that that's our preferred option. The preferred option is that. Yeah. And then go from there down to that. We really strongly prefer this option. And that's the best that we, we really could do. I think that's excellent. I think we should absolutely make that known. And I think we will, when the time comes, I hope show up um, both in my role as a counselor and in our roles as former AHRA members to those meetings where this is being discussed. Um, and it, 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 it's challenging to know that it feels like we're always fighting <laughs> um, to get what we need to get, you know, but that's just part of this, you know, the reality here um, when there's a lot of demand on the budget. And so um, I think if we make it clear that option one is our preferred option, and I, I, I think um, for option three, um, I'm, I'm hearing that uh, Dr. Rhodes is is on board with a hundred thousand. Um, the only consideration there is if we think one fifty is going to be um, pretty steady for a while or somewhere in that range, you know, then we're looking at fifty annually to build the fund, which you know, um, but but I think it's more important in some ways to uh, be able to get initiatives going um, and to ensure that the memory of uh, is not lost, you know, and that the momentum is gained. Um, so is there anyone that uh, has, are we good with a hundred? And if, if not, please, please raise your hand. Okay. So the only other question then here is an option two um, is four years, the option, um, this was Sean's preferred option, by the way. Um, he thought accelerating the fund and having it um, get up to that 2 million. And I think four years was actually his suggestion, um, which is why I used it in, in this option. It, does that seem reasonable? 
to folks. And again, it's not what we want. It's just in terms of this option. Yes. The only, thing, the only thing that's missing there, and maybe it's um is is whether in that option, um, since it involves moving funds from uh, reserves in this gradual in this gradual movement, there's still then cannabis tax revenue that's not being touched. Could that go in the way we've just described in option three? Could that still be initiatives could be put in against that up to perhaps a, a, a hundred thousand? So you're saying some combination of option two and three could be thought of by the finance committee. I, I guess what I'm saying really is, is that the the beauty of option one, uh, the I'll call the, the Irv Rhodes option, is that it, it takes place immediately and just as soon as the endowment would start generating would start generating funds, might take an, a, a year, a year to get there, but then we'd have those 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 funds on an ongoing basis. With this one, it's not telling us what we have except for four years down the road. So it, it's 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 back to really the unfortunate situation we highlight in the previous paragraph right. of it's just we're 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 certain in four years or five, uh, get, again, giving time for the endowment to start generating funds, we're at five rather than right now the the, the conceivable 10, uh, you know, 10 years off. So it still means we'd be pretty far off if unless we're adding some language to option two that talks about um, that, you know, initiatives before the, the four years is completed could be submitted and uh, uh, to the town with uh, possibly coming from cannabis tax revenue. I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm just highlighting the silence in that option to the issue of trying to get started at least within one to two years with funding initiatives. Yeah, and Sean's sort of uh, recommendation to deal with that was to ask, for example, that the town manager, uh, you know, um, set aside block grant money or that we work with CPA. So to sort of have to find other ways to get this amount for the next four years. Um, I That to me pushes this option down into the least, uh, you know, the least supported for me um, without that additional language. Um, one possibility is that we cut the four years down to two years. So we still have option two, but it's now two years. To me, the likelihood of them approve that being approved or supported is no different than just putting it all in now in a sense, you know. So, not sure what that gains us. Um, what I'd say, Michelle, is this: it can be left in in the language that it is, since it 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 is the language that you know it is based upon what you and Dr. Rhodes got from from meeting with the with uh, uh, the, the former finance director. My uh, my point is uh, that the, um, if, if at some point in presenting, or I just think we need to think about what is what are the implications of that? Because yeah. um, it sounds like it, it just, if that was the one then selected, there would be no funds available other than uh, and, and again, it's even to highlight that if it's to say from existing funding such as Community Preservation Act or Community Development Block Grant, if you if if even that's put in, at least there's something to say that we're not waiting four to five years. Uh, that that there are other funding streams, but that this funding stream would not be activated until until. Uh, uh, for four to five years down the road. Yeah. Do you think including in this option uh, that we would still, so it would be the, the, the fund would be fully realized in 
reached over the next four years, but that for the four years, we would like, if this option were chosen, a guaranteed, you know, 50,000 or whatever the number is toward initiatives. And we don't care where it comes from. We just want some sort of um, assurance of that. Um, and, and maybe we're getting into the weeds a little bit here. And, and this is a late hour to do that. Um, so yeah, let me, does anyone, is anyone opposed to this option actually being moved? To, do you like the placement of this option or should this option be, uh, down as option three, um, to sort of, in, in, from a visual standpoint, make it clear that having money now is our priority. Is that okay? Okay. All right. So um, let me just come back to the question about the press release. Um, in terms of timing, I uh, would like to just remind everybody that our report will be um, presented along with, you know, a slideshow that I'm working on. So we'll still go ahead and meet next week on the 25th at our normal time um, so that we're prepared for our October 2nd meeting. Um, and it's possible you may get an email from me saying the slideshow is not ready yet. And you know what? Um, let's meet actually on the second to approve the slideshow or to discuss our presentation, but we can deal with that then. Most importantly, I want to get this out into the world. Um, so if we approve this document today, um, then it will be going into its sort of visual process, uh, which has already begun. We approved the theme last week and, and that will um, continue to take place. Um, and so personally, I wouldn't want to publish this any later than a Thursday of a week. Like I wouldn't want to publish it necessarily on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Um, we could publish it a week from today, which I think I could confidently say all of the items, the outstanding items in terms of visualizing it and putting it all together and everything uh, would would be done. What do folks think about that? Any thoughts on good days of week to publish reports like this? <laughs> Is Monday, will it get lost in people's Monday mess? Is it better to do it on Tuesday, the 26th, which gives people who might want to come to public comment on the second, it gives council, uh, you know, just a little less than a week before, or should we push and try to get it out on Thursday, this Thursday, the 21st? What are, what are thoughts on that? Next Tuesday is fine. Okay. And I think that's good, Dr. Rhodes, because um, Paul is, you know, short his communications person and we did do our own press release, but there will still need to be some steps that are taken um, to get it out, actually. So is everyone good with publishing the report next Tuesday, the 26th? Okay. One final piece. Um the question of whether an executive summary should appear in our report is something that we have discussed here and there. And ultimately, Mattia and I uh, sort of thought, you know, we want people to read the report. Um, we don't want, you know, a, a section that uh, will sort of you know, prevent people from going into the meat of the report. Um, and we wrote the press release, which sort of gives some teasers about what's in the report, but doesn't necessarily or at all um, do justice to what's in the report. Um, so we decided to do a two page executive summary to show to the group as a possibility, which all it really does is um, summarize the recommendations um, succinctly. If the committee wants to include this, we could include it right up front 
you know, after the uh, table of contents, we can include it in the back as a part of the appendix. So we could say, you know, we could prompt people to to say, if you, you know, if you're looking for a summary of recommendations and you go right to the appendix, that's my preference personally. Um, but I'm curious what other, or we could not include it at all. So are there any thoughts about that, Dr. Rhodes? Yeah, I would, I would put the uh, summary of recommendations in the uh, appendix A and B. Uh, in terms of, of an executive summary, I wouldn't have an executive summary, but I would have some kind of introductory notes or introductory, not introduct, introductory notes, but some kind of introductions uh, to the report. Um, yeah, I think introduction introduction to the report is a lot better than doing an executive summary. Okay, I agree, and we have a really strong introduction. By the way, this will also include the dedication. Uh, before the introduction, it will include the dedic the dedication um, to Dr. Dimitri Spaz. It will include acknowledgments. And of course, on the first page, it will include um, all of our names as committee members. So all of those kinds of things will be up front. Um, and then we can, in the introduction, somehow reference that if you're looking for a summary of recommendations, it's in the appendix. Does anyone, um, does anyone have an issue with that? Yeah, yeah. The only thing I have an issue with, with is that you don't tell people if you're looking for a summary rec recommendation <laughs> to go to the no. That's just that's all part of the uh, table of contents. <laughs> Good point. If you'd like to stop reading now. Yeah, <laughs> <Just> <laughs> <go>. <laughs> okay. Oh, I love you, Dr. Rhodes. <laughs> all right. So that works. Um, so okay. Um the final question I really have then is, do we need a motion um, to approve this report? Um, are there, uh, is there consensus um, or, and um, I wanted to, does everyone have a little bit more time? We're, we're so close here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the two pieces that I told you were still um, sort of outstanding in my mind were um, uh, the recommendation to the superintendent. Um, there was, so are, are folks familiar with John Bonifaz? I know who, I know of him. I okay. don't know him. He's a community member. He's a lawyer. Um, his his child is one of the leaders of Sunrise Amherst um, and uh, just an excellent uh, human being and, and reviewed our report. Um, and his recommendation, the only recommendation, was that we extend the superintendent piece to include the middle school and the elementary school so that uh, right now I believe that we only have it listed um, as a as the for the high school our folks how do do folks have any strong reactions to that wait a minute what are you referring to I'm not sure let me yeah let me just pull it up here um, to make it and if you have the uh, if you have it in front of you too um, we're I looking I have it in front of you. okay no worries um, so we're looking at, all right, I'm going to share my screen here again. Okay. Um, so to the superintendent of Amherst Pelham Regional Public School, um, we recommend that the Amherst Pelham Regional High School re-examine and update its history curricula with the goal of engaging in deeper truth telling. And what John was suggesting that we simply expand that to include the middle school and the elementary schools. And so before we would include that in this recommendation, I wanted to um, see 
what what the committee thought. Well, and uh, when I look at that, I say, yeah, yeah. Well, what is appropriate for the elementary school? I mean, what is appropriate for the high school? I mean, middle school may be not be appropriate for the elementary school. So unless we have some specificity here, I don't, I, I can't see expanding it to that unless it's going to be some generalized global kind of philosophical stance that we want to get across. Right, Dr. Rhodes, and that's that's why I wanted to bring it to the committee. Um, I mean, we could simply say as appropriate or developmentally appropriate or or something that would make it clear that we're, you know, that what we might teach in the high school or how we teach it may be different. Um, any other thoughts on that? I mean, I'm if if we want to keep this as is, that's fine too. I just I wanted to bring that feedback. I think it's just a it's a recommendation, and so obviously it would be uh, taken up and tweaked by the leadership of the um, of the uh, school uh, district, both the superintendent as well as curriculum people, uh, as well as the actual leader in each building. So I think it can be generalized beyond the high school and just, uh, you know, trusting that it filters down from the superintendent to the building leadership, to the leadership in each building and the specific departments even in, in, those, in those different buildings, regardless of their categorization, secondary or, or elementary. I just would say one other thing in the line, we recommend the high school draw on the considerable resources. I'd like to put in a plug for the considerable resources of the Black Studies departments uh, and, and related departments of our area uh, colleges and university. Um, our, our entire five college uh, but if we're wanting to strictly limit to town of Amherst, then Amherst College, uh, Hampshire College, and the University of Massachusetts Amherst. We have from our libraries to our Black Studies departments to other uh, expertise and other departments, we have considerable resources that can help uh, the uh, all, all down the line for, uh, to, to really look at how to revamp. I could even name our Center for, for Race and um, Equity uh, that uh, is in our College of Education with uh, uh, Keisha Green and Jamila Elias Scott. There's just tremendous resources here above and beyond, you know, the, the online and the book uh, of the 1619 Project. Dr. Shabazz, that is really, really excellent feedback. And we will make sure, unless there's any um, opposition to that, we will absolutely make sure to include that, those those organizations and uh, other resources. So I see Hala, and then it will be Hala, and then Dr. Rhodes. Yep. Um, I'm in bad, in ad, hmm. I advocate to add middle school and elementary school in terms of maybe even interrogating what we're already teaching. I was in a third grade class and the woman was, teacher was presenting on Rosa Parks and she was an old tired lady. And that narrative is actually not true. And it feeds into that hero saints and holidays of who's a safe black person. No, she was an activist. This was a an intentional thing, a woman in her forties. So like, it's not necessarily going to kindergarten and talking about the horrors of slavery and enslavement, but it's interrogating what we already are teaching and seeing how white supremacy and safety has like influenced that and starting to just, you know, really do a deeper truth. Thank you. Absolutely. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Dr. Rhodes. I guess I look at this and as a school committee member, I, I think, all right, I can I can see uh, the superintendent uh, in relationship to revising uh, history curriculum. That's that is something that is uh, there. Uh, 
and impossible. And then the whole thing about uh, bringing greater transparency to the hiring process. You know, um, and part of this is 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 that uh, the the superintendent uh, is under the school committee in relation, relationship to oversight, and also under the school committee in relationship to policy. The school committee um, does its job. In relationship to the uh, superintendent, which is which it is which is a, it is responsible for hiring and or firing, uh, but in terms of everything else, uh, we do what we do via our policy. So if we had a policy that said that uh, history uh, in the schools shall include these things, all right, then that's something that has to be followed. Uh, so when I look at this, I, I think, all right, to the super, are, are we saying to the superintendent of schools, regional public schools, revise uh, the history curricula for greater truth telling? Uh, yes, that's possible. That's partially true in terms of the, the superintendent having some control over that, um, but not totally true. But uh, so, I, I guess the bottom line for me, I, I'm, I'm sort of like conflicted by it. And and I'm, I'm more conflicted by by saying bring more transparency to the hiring process. That is something that the that is really the guide, the bottom line guide to the hiring process is part and par, par, uh, parcel of the policy of the school committee. Even though the superintendent and the principals have control of the hiring process, but everything goes back to policy. So, uh, and, and then the final thing is putting those two together seems to be uh, out of place. And I see one is being not related to the other. Uh, and I would say, uh, and, and then, I, I mean, I guess I don't know if the context for saying bring trans greater. When we think about this document, this is a document we're putting together as a report uh, that is not only uh, going to uh, be available for this year, but in, in future years. Uh, and so when you say bring greater transparency to the hiring process, what exactly do we mean? Uh, it says additionally, we recommend that the school district, school district revise its, its hiring process to prioritize transparency, equity, and stakeholder input, which, 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 it, which by implication means that that's not already there. And now if you looked at our hiring process, if you looked at the policies behind that hiring process, especially through the, uh, the DEI lens that is there, this is superfluous. Okay, so, um... Yeah, I hear all of that. And I think the reason this recommendation was included is because um, there ha has been sort of a voice, particularly more recently coming forward, voices coming forward, uh, that there may be uh, some internal hiring practices. Um, there have been folks talking about nepotism and um, you know, other such related, uh, concerns. Um, so in the context, um, let me make sure I understand what you're saying, Dr. Rhodes. Um, are you saying that the hiring process that the superintendent uses is guided by a policy that the school committee creates? Yeah, partially so. And also if, you're saying this, if you're, if you're saying additionally, we recommend school district, you know, uh, uh, revise this hiring process. It says that you know what the hiring process is. And I'm sitting here saying, wait a minute, our hiring process in the schools as of now 
and has been for the last five years is a process that always was done through the lens of DEI. Okay. Okay. So um, would it be more accurate to ask that the school district review its hiring process or recommit or I, I don't know. I mean, we're working on a reparations report here. Exactly, and so Michelle. Exactly. Because you you've got three you got <laughs> three uh former school committee members here in the room. Uh one is currently on the school committee. So uh we're yeah we could go in the weeds of this for a while. I I could recommend I recommend just deleting I uh, or you know um the because um there it, it, it does assume a lot if and 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 I I recommend that because I don't see where it's specific to to our work if it was specifically relative to the question of racial imbalance and how do we get more black people hired in the in the school and in certain areas particularly in the academic areas then that that is a legitimate that that's a legitimate uh, thing related to reparative justice in my view, but that's not what's what's written here, and it still would entail us to to kind of uh, uh, go into this a little more than what I think we we have time for in terms of as Dr. Rhodes is saying, be conscious of what what is the current policies, what has been the efforts toward toward trying to to address these policies. And I think that would just take us a little a little too far afield here. I get the sentiment of it, but uh, but I think that um that, that that's an area that the future group can certainly uh revisit in terms of reparative justice initiatives around the problem of racial imbalance as 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 the language goes in our in our school district. Yeah, I think getting ready that that particular part is a really good idea. All right. It's gone as long as um, Hala and Ms. Bridges uh, are in, in agreement with that. I just, yes. I will. Yes, Ms. Bridges? Yeah. Okay. Uh, All right. So I do just want to say that this piece, um, and, and I'm, yeah, okay, we're going to remove it um, so we don't forget. Um, I had uh, a, a very lengthy conversation just about a week and a half ago with um, a, a black uh, staff at the schools, staff member at the schools, uh, who said that they, I don't want to be identifying, but that they had been in the school district for a long time working in the school district for a long time and that they had seen over the years uh, black staff and teachers overlooked for uh, positions, overlooked for advancement uh, opportunities. Um, and from that person's point of view, they were overlooked because there were other sort of internal favoritism almost as a word maybe that I'll use that was happening. So where uh, this person described a black staff person who had all of the credentials had was more than qualified for the position, uh, you know, the promotion would not get the promotion in favor of somebody who was less qualified, but who had a better connection with some of the powers that be in the district. So I just, I just felt like I need to say that. And if we don't want to include anything in the report, um, even just to say that we think the successor body should take this under consideration with the in partnership with the school board and others. Um, but if we want to go silent on it, we can do that too. I just I I sort of feeling strongly that at least that this person took an hour of their time to talk to me about this and I could feel 
uh, that it was, it was, it was, it was, it was harmful to this person and their experience living in this community and working at the schools. Dr. Rhodes. So was she specifically, specifically talking about this in terms of race, that the person was looked over, overlooked because of race? They said that uh, where there was uh, a black person who was qualified or more than qualified, uh, that person would be overlooked for somebody else that was not, you know, it, it wasn't. It wasn't clear whether the other person could have been black also. It, it was months. clear that in the cases they were describing, the person was not. Um, but I don't want to get too personal. Um, you but know, the person, the person overlooked was overlooked for someone who was white rather than black. Is that what you're saying? White or another person of color, not right. I mean, unless it's really specific specifically saying, hey, I was this person who was really black and who, who was really, really well qualified was overlooked for a person who, who was white, who was not as qualified. That's specific. However, if it's non-specific as to race, then you're talking about 99% of every workplace in this country. I think that for me, Michelle, it's not to go silent on the the matter of the uh, the reality of continued uh, racial discrimination in hiring, whether due to implicit bias or whether due to explicit bias. Um, there is ample. Um, uh, th this is an ongoing concern. I can speak at it, uh, to it from the institution that I'm a part of, University of Massachusetts. We are still, uh, you know, we still recognize in every search committee, every time we create a search committee, uh, we are engaged in trying to, to engage in best practices of how to get that department to uh, to have a, a robust search, one that really encourages uh, people from underrepresented groups to apply, and that when those applications come in from members of underrepresented groups, that they are handled appropriately um, and that they are not subject to uh, uh, questions and, and interactions in the hiring process, in the search process. That that, that reflect bias, uh, implicit or explicit. This is an ongoing reality in employment matters uh, writ large in our community and in the country. However, I don't think the way the language was expressed for that line, that transparency is what solves that. It's yeah. not a problem of transparency. It's a problem of implementing all of the necessary best practices of how to eliminate bias and implicit or explicit from our hiring process. Yeah. One thing that needs to be understood within the, the schools that there have been concerns, explicit concerns and charges raised that uh, there was reverse racism going on and that people were being hired uh, just because they were BIPOC uh, over those people who were more qualified, who happened just who happened to be just be white, and that those charges are are, are part and parcel of what is going on and will continue to go on. Every time you get into a situation, at least in my mind, where you you are subject to the charge of uh, reverse racism. Then you, then you are, then you're in a situation where, well, you know, uh, you you're you're a racist. When you say you're a racist, why well, you're a racist? Because you're 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 making everything about race. Uh, and if you're making everything about race, uh, then uh, you are saying that the black people uh, that it's all right to discriminate 
that, that you know that is all right to discriminate. That's 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 the charge that is being made within the confines of of the uh, Amherst School Committee uh, school community, uh, and and that's an uncomfortable kind of a charge uh, because racism, regardless of what it is, is racism. And the thing is, how do you bring about the values that are inherent in diversity, equity, and inclusion so that you do get a diverse teaching uh, staff and diverse professional staff, et cetera? How do you do that in such a way uh, where you're not then doing that which you said that you were against. Yeah, yeah. And and I think, you know, I really hear that. And I think that this, it sounds to me, it's, it's a much more complex uh, consideration and matter to be discussed. And, and I think is beyond at this point in time, our ability to do so. So um, I think if we're all in agreement with that, um, we do have to call one last period of public comment. There are two attendees, um, and I do see that one's hand is raised. So I'm going to bring that person in. But before I do, um, I want to, again, ask if we need a vote to approve the report as you've seen it, the, fi the, the final draft report, or if you are uh, have anything to share about the report that you, other than this piece that we just reviewed that you'd like to have included or removed, or if everything looks good to go, I'm gonna send it into final production phase. Um, so while you're- I'm happy to proceed by general consensus that we have approved our draft, uh, but I'm also happy to put it in the form of a motion uh, according to whatever my colleagues may desire. Okay. Well, it's, it's, since um, we're not seeing a call for a motion um, from any one individual, I think we can assume that we are approving it by consensus and we'll move it into the next stage um, of final, final, <laughs> final stages. <laughs> um, and in the meantime, I'm going to, let's see, bring over Kiara and uh, so this is our second period of public comment. And if you'd like to make a public comment, please raise your hand. Um, and Kiara has done so and is being moved. And welcome, Kiara. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Great. I just have a quick comment about the um, discussion around the successor body. So to my understanding, the successor body is going to kind of um, help to direct or oversee how um, the recommendations get implemented moving forward after this body is dissolved. And so my question around the composition is why why would it be BIPOC, people of color, marginalized groups, if this is a reparations assembly directed toward Black reparations? Uh, um, because, you know, marginalized groups can really mean anyone. And there's no guarantee when you say that, that anyone on there necessarily would even be Black, let alone um, a descendant of U.S. slavery. So I'm just curious about that. Um, and also, you know, because that's going to obviously influence the direction of like the priorities of that of that body and how uh, considerations around disbursement of funds happen. So uh, I think that's important to, to really look at that. And as well, um, I think you should also create some kind of um, specific recommendation around somebody being a descendant of U.S. slavery on there, um, because if you don't specify that, then there's no guarantee that you're going to have that representation. You may coincidentally, but it's not. There's no guarantee that you will. So I recommend that you also, whatever the number ends up being, that you have that specification as well on there. And that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kiara. Thank you for your um, thoughtful comments. Um, and I, uh, normally we wouldn't do this. Um, hold on one second. I'm just going to move 
Kiara back to the attendees. So I think Kiara makes a really strong point. I just, I want to say that um, both of her points, the first though, is it's possible with the composition that we approved um, that there would be no people that would identify as black. Um, and so um, I think we might want to, where for the community safety and social justice committee, that would make, you know, that's fine that they've used that language. This is where I got that from. Um, but let me just quickly, I know. Michelle, I actually thought yeah. we, we had landed on just black in the course of the conversation. We had landed on black as just what we were going with uh, as opposed to BIPOC, but maybe that was just in my ears at any rate. <laughs> <laughs> what what I would recommend to be more 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 clear on it is yes um, that uh, that no fewer than five of the seven shall represent members of the um, uh, eligible um, group that black reparations that reparations are addressed to. Um, and what in parentheses or whatever I think that means is that goes towards our concentric circles mm -hmm. that we would first and foremost prioritize uh, uh, Black residents of Amherst who have ancestry uh, going back multiple generations here and uh, uh, that uh, as well as ancestry that that uh, goes back in, into uh, shadow enslavement in the United States. Secondarily, that it would also look at Black residents of Amherst who uh, have uh, uh, ancestry that goes back to slavery who are not necessarily from Amherst or from, from Massachusetts, but elsewhere in the United States. And then ultimately from there, uh, persons of African descent who have been uh, been harmed in general by uh, slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. So for me, uh, I think it corresponds with our concentric circles model, our inclusive model of reparations that we would, that the guidance we should give should also be that uh, up to, um, you know, at least five of the seven members come from the community uh, as defined by the the eligibility or criteria discussion established in this report. Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. Is then is everybody agree with that approach? All right. Great. So I just want to make sure that I can that um, Ms. Bridges and Dr. Rhodes both I can hear them both and they can hear me and 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 everybody's in agreement there? Yes. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bridges. Dr. Rhodes? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Okay, awesome. Um, and Hal, I saw you shaking your head, so, okay, <laughs> great. Um, this final is a final- on that, One final thing on that, Michelle, that I just sure. say is, is, and I know you were thinking about those other committees, but the, the legacy of this committee, we had more than enough applications come in from from black folks uh i know because i know some that that were turned down uh inclusive of the person we started our meeting out with uh d had applied herself to be on this committee and um in the screening process it was decided that two shabazzes would be too much. So, so that was wrong in my I, opinion. <laughs> well, I think she was still here with me through it all anyway. I mean, she was in the background of many a meeting. She was whispering in my ear for many a meeting. So in many ways she was still there. But I just say that to say really that I don't think will and and, and in the way our our in the work that we've done and we're doing, I think we will get a robust robust number of applications from people that correspond with our uh, criteria discussion in terms of the community, uh, the targeted community for reparations. Perfect. Okay, great. I agree. 
Um, that's excellent. And uh, one final note, um, I talked with Hala earlier today about uh, the Black churches, the historic Black churches here in Amherst. And if everybody uh, is okay with this, we would like to include in the early part of the report, um, just some mention of their history and perhaps even a photograph um, just so that they are not left out of our report. We are not making any recommendations that relate to those uh, churches, but we want to make sure they are um, certainly included in the report. Uh, Hala, did I, did I even come? Okay, <laughs> great. Um, is that, is everyone okay with that? Great. Yes, yes. Bridges? I have okay. So pretty old pictures of the Hope Church also in, in family pictures. So that would be great. If you um, are uh, able to or willing or would like to contribute those or any any one of one or more, that would be fantastic, Ms. Bridges. And anybody who contributes a photo, by the way, uh, will credit uh, so that it's clear where the photo, whose family it came from. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And um, so this is, I think, the longest meeting we've had in a long time. Um, and Asa, it was really nice to have you here. Um, so I, I hope you enjoyed the meeting. <laughs> um, yes, I found it very interesting. Um, may I please uh, email me a copy of the uh, draft report? Absolutely. Um, why don't I email, I don't have your email address unless you want to read it over the public meeting. If you don't, I could ask Jennifer to send it to you. Uh, yes, it'll work. She, actually, actually, she can, um, she can uh, forward it to me if that'll be more convenient. That'd be perfect. Okay. I'll send her a note to do that. All right. Any other comments or questions? Uh, we will be, again, we'll be meeting next week just to make sure we're ready for our, um, our presentation. And we will plan to publish the report on Tuesday, September 26th. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Great meeting. And we will, yep. And we'll see you all soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Meeting adjourned at 4 p.m. Bye-bye.